This online episode is made possible by the support of the Mulch and Soil Council. To assure the products you use are properly labeled, conform to industry standards, and are tested for contaminants like arsenic, insist on mulch and soil with the council certification seal on the package. Creating an eco-friendly landscape at home is catching on in neighborhoods all across the country. I'm striving to make my yard more sustainable, and for most of us, it's a process as we work with our existing landscape. Yet for Stephen and Kristen Patagas, it was their mission the moment they moved into their property over 10 years ago. Today, we'll spend some time with these horticultural experts and learn a bit about what they did and what they do now to create and maintain a more sustainable environment. All that and more today on Growing a Greener World. This program was funded by the following. Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Live with Bents, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Live with Bents, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. At Subaru, we care about preserving the environment. That's why we build our vehicles in zero landfill plants, which produce less landfill waste in a year than a single family household in a day. Subaru, a proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. As you approach the home of Stephen and Kristen Patagas, it's quickly apparent that at least one serious gardener lives here. But for this couple, they are equally passionate about their work and play. Their background in horticulture runs deep, and so does their dedication to environmental stewardship. Professionally, they're co-owners of Hortus Oasis, where they provide services in garden design and consultation. Kristen is a horticulturalist and Florida certified landscape designer, and Stephen is an award-winning landscape architect. Their home garden provides the perfect place to showcase their skills, trial new plants, and spend time together in their shared passion. Today, their labor of love is a lush oasis and thriving example for sustainable landscapes everywhere. So Stephen, here we are, Hortus Oasis. Now, this is your home and your business. It's where it all happens for right. you and Kristen. And I'm really intrigued by that name. What was the inspiration for it? The inspiration goes a ways back. Kristen and I were both in school at the University of Massachusetts. We were living in the bottom floor of a farmhouse. And from up on top of Mount Sugarloaf, we could look down. There was a little postage stamp. It looked just like an oasis. Wow. So there was the oasis part. And then we moved here. We started up our business and moved to this house. Hortus is the Latin word for garden. Mm. So we combined them. This is our garden oasis. So it was about 10 years ago that you moved here. Now, as a landscape architect and a designer, I'm sure you're ready to roll up your sleeves and get busy, but I know you did the right thing first, and that was to put the plan on paper. That's right. That was the first thing to do, and that in itself was a challenge because we have traveled a lot, we've seen a lot of gardens, <laughs> and we wanted to do it all. Pack it in here. That's right. But we had to just do, we had to make sure that we distilled it down to our program and what would work with the house as well. So when you did get to work, what was the first step? Because I know initially it had a lot of turf and some hedges. That's right. Well, which brings up the whole environmental issues. We wanted it to be sustainable. Yeah. So we wanted to create a garden that was going to be as green as possible. And that meant eliminating the turf uh -huh. and lowering the grade. Because the back of the house, the grade is higher. It's lower in the front. The water drains to the street. And then it drains down into the lakes, which pollutes the lakes. So we wanted to keep it all on, on site and also recharge our aquifer as well and water our plants. Yeah, a key concept to sustainable sites is to make sure that you retain the water on the property as much as possible. So taking the time to basically dish it right. to retain the water and recharge the aquifer was key here. And since every time you bring a plant in, it comes in with a volume of soil, what do you do with all that extra soil? So you get rid of it to start with. Ah, good point. 
Now, even with the best plans, they don't always work out. And in your case, you had a few challenges along oh, the way. Oh, we had major challenges, especially <laughs> in 2004. Mm -hmm. Three hurricanes, the third one, Hurricane Jean. Mm -hmm. We had a large shade tree right there near the curb, blown over across the landscape on the house. Oh. Uh, the landscape was just started. So guess what that meant for our light conditions? Oh, it opened it wide up. So you went from at least a partially shady yard to full sun, as I see right here, and not a bit of turf in sight. That's correct. So we made some adjustments. So what did you put here? So instead of turf panels, which you didn't want to do turf anyway, typically in a formal layout like this, you would have grass mm -hmm. on either side of the walkway. We came in with the dwarf Asian jasmine, the low ground cover. And I see a nice frame of a viburnum hedge around the dwarf jasmine. Tell me about that. Well, that is the Walters viburnum. That's one of our favorite natives, and it's a dwarf cultivar of a taller shrub. It has white blooms in the spring and again in the fall, and has, then has berries for wildlife. Now, dwarf doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to stay small, but viburnums are fun very well to pruning, right? Yes, they do. You just want to make sure, don't shear it, though. You want yeah. to do hand pruning. You can see it gives a little bit of texture and a little regular character to it. And then you have a nice contrast over here on the corner to anchor the entrance with the coon tea. That's right. We wanted to have a textural change there. Yes. And that's a good, sturdy plant for Florida, isn't it? It is a good one, yeah. It's one of our good natives. And then uh, African iris you have behind this to That's get right. that spiky foliage look. That's right, get some spiky texture in there and some white bloom. I guess the point here is, though, that I'm seeing some natives as well as some non-natives mixed into your sustainable landscape. Talk about that. that that's correct. Well, it's really about the right plant in the right place and making sure that you have the plant that's going to fill your design need mm -hmm. and be low water use in this case and adapt to our well-draining soils. A lot of natives are growing in all different types of soils. They're used to their native habitat. In our urban environment, we have a whole mix of soils. So what you're saying is it's more than just native plants. It's really the right plant in the right place combined with water management. That's correct. Studies show that natives and non-natives appear to be using the same amount of water as they're getting established. With an ever-increasing demand on water, studies are being conducted around the country on ways to conserve more of this precious and finite resource, especially when it comes to outdoor use. One recent study through the University of Florida took a closer look at just how much water it takes to properly establish plants in the landscape without using any more than necessary. Patty spent some time with Dr. Ed Gilman to learn more about the study and how we can apply those findings at home. Water conservation is a big issue across America, especially in Florida. You just completed a study on how much water it takes to actually establish shrubs. What prompted the study? Well, it kind of stopped raining. And that was a big issue because there were landscapes out there that were brand new and folks had, did not want their landscapes turning brown. And the water management districts were on the other end saying, well, wait a minute, we've got to supply water in, uh, to homes and so forth. And they started to talk about cutting off water to landscapes. And that prompted a lot of controversy in the industry. We had the green industry, the landscapers and maintenance firms that needed the water to keep their businesses going. And all these homeowners that wanted their plants alive. And without water, uh, they, could, they couldn't do that. So we needed to find out what kind of frequency what kind of volumes of irrigation were actually needed to get plants established. So there weren't any benchmarks uh, previously on how much water it takes to establish shrubs? And isn't that amazing? There were no benchmarks. We really didn't have anything that we could really hang our hat on and say, this is what it takes to get shrubs established. And we wanted to know how much volume and how frequently sh we should apply it. We, we didn't know. So that was the focus of this research. Is as gardeners, we've always been taught to water deeply but infrequently. Right, and that's kind of how I was brought up too, but this study did not show that. It showed that the best way to get a shrub established in a landscape is to water often and a little bit of water. How much water is that? Well, the, the little bit amounted to just under a gallon, let's call it a gallon of water. And if we applied more than about a gallon of water, we got no increase in response. So it was just a waste of water. And now that we know how much water to actually use, we can actually save water and conserve. We save water by doing it right the first time so that the whole planting doesn't fail. If it fails, then we have to go back and do it all again and use all those resources and more water and fuel to get to the site. And we don't want to do that. So let's do it right the first time, adding a little bit very frequently. 
Another interesting part of the study was comparing natives with exotics or non-native plants. And we found no difference between the amount of water required to establish natives compared to the amount of water required to establish non-native plants. Really? Well, there's been such a movement towards planting more native plants in your landscape, so that's really interesting. There's a lot of reasons to apply, to put natives in your landscape, attracting wildlife, for example. But they require the same amount of water to establish as non-native plants. So what can the home gardener take away from this study and implement in their own yards? Well, it, I, I see a couple things. I see apply one gallon of water once a week, and that'll get shrubs established. And if you do that for four to six months, most shrubs in most climates, they'll be fairly well established. If you want to put more water, apply it twice a week, but the same amount of water. So a total of two gallons a week is all you need. Any more is wasteful and it's simply running through the root ball and into the soil underneath and of no benefit to anybody. And that's how we can save water. Now Stephen, even though you have a fully planted landscape with established drought tolerant plants, I also know that you have supplemental irrigation in here. Talk about that. No, we certainly do. Um, we have a couple of challenges. First, we have well draining soils, which means the moisture that is applied, the rainfall, we get a lot of rainfall here, goes away very quickly. Yeah. And then we also have high temperatures and maybe uh, in the 90s for a couple of weeks at a time. So if you go on vacation for a couple of weeks, you need to make sure that these plants are getting watered because you come home and those plants are dead. What's the real cost to sustainability to have to replace all those and then water them again to establish? That's pretty high. Oh, it's a high cost. That's not green at all. I yeah. mean, that's going backwards. Yeah. So instead, we're trying to move forwards. And so we're proactive about our irrigation and doing it in a very efficient manner. So you've got a few tricks to make that happen most efficiently. Tell me about those. Oh. One interesting one is what's called the rotary nozzle, which emits large drops of water. And when it's rotating and slowly putting out the water, it almost looks like a dancing water effect. And the lo large drops aren't affected by the wind nearly as much. Right. So it's very efficient that way. And then the weight of those large drops makes its way down into the root system a lot faster. And then, of course, you combine that with the time of day that you're watering, which is very early morning. Correct. You've got optimal conditions there. That's true. We're trying to keep it away from the time when the sun is out and when from when there's breeze. Okay. That's trick number one. Okay. Number two is the drip line. This is a plastic tubing that runs along the ground through the landscape. And you'll notice that it has an emitter right uh -huh. there. And you'll have emitters either a foot apart or every 18 inches apart. We go a foot apart because of our well-drained soils. And we get this situation where the water drains down pretty much in a column. It's not a cone. Uh -huh. So you need to cover enough of the root zone by going a little tighter. And for Florida, 12 inches, at least in your area, is perfect. It's perfect for it, yes. Trick number three. Okay, trick number three. This one's pretty exciting. This little object right here does a lot. Okay, first it opens up, uh -huh. has a filter to filter it to keep everything clean inside, and it has little emitters inside to control how much of a volume of water goes through each of these little ports. There's eight, eight ports, and so you can control the volume of water at each port. Okay, so let me stop you right there. So there's a supply line that comes into this area. That's right, comes in right through the bottom. Okay, and so you can go anywhere from one of these emitters up to eight. Up to eight of them, that's correct. Okay, same amount of volume or what? Well. You can go anywhere from a half gallon all the way up to 25 gallons of water, depending upon how much water you need to apply at the end of this tube. So you can really micromanage all eight of these emitters, just depending on what the reason is for the irrigation. That's correct. Now, we have a lot of containers. We have over 100 containers here at Gordis Oasis. So we need to get water to them. We want to be able to travel. Yeah. So we have one of these going to each one of them, and it, the volume of water depends upon how much water each of those containers needs. And this is also good for just establishing new plants. Like in your landscape, it's fully planted out, but you trial new plants a lot, I'm sure. That's true. You need to put those in the ground, and we already know that that's going to require some extra water compared to what's already in here. That's correct. There's that establishment period. Yeah. The last thing we want to do is run a zone that waters everything in the landscape to get a couple of plants established. So we take one of these tubes that we have as a spare all the time, and we direct this to the plants that are newly planted, and so it gets watered a little more frequently until they're established, and then the tube goes away. So in that case, you get micro-irrigation with pinpoint efficiency in an established landscape. It's pretty slick. Now, whenever Stephen and Kristen are trialing a new plant, it goes in the ground, but you know what gets left behind? It's the black plastic pot. 
Now we gardeners, we create a lot of beauty, but unfortunately there's a lot of waste that's left behind in the process. And in spite of our best efforts to recycle, a lot of those pots never end up getting recycled. The problem is, unlike milk jugs and water bottles, there's an industry standard there and there are breeze to sort in the recycling facility. But these plastic pots, not so much. You look at the bottom of these, this one happens to be a two. Yet this one, it's a five. This one doesn't have any number, and that one looks like a six. Now at some point in that recycling process, there's a human being that has to sort all this, and that becomes a real problem. Plus the fact that these are often very dirty, sometimes contaminated with chemicals, or maybe full of rocks. So, in spite of our best efforts, where we think they're being recycled, a lot of these still end up in the landfill. Now there's some good news because manufacturers are making great strides for growers and consumers like us with these plastic pots that our plants go into. Like these, for example. Now it looks like a good hard plastic, but you know what? They're made from rice hulls. Now, these will not break down until they go in the ground, which is how they're designed. And one of the nice features is with a style like this that has the slits, the roots will come right out of there to give the plants a head start once they do go in the ground. These guys, they also look like plastic pots, but they're weed-based. And they come in lots of different sizes. They're good and sturdy but weeds are a highly sustainable resource and there's no petroleum used to make these. One of the really cool ones out there right now, this is made from composted cow manure. Now you might think that's kind of nasty, but don't worry, it is composted, it doesn't smell at all. I use these all the time. And why I like these is in addition to the fact that it's from renewable resources, you put this in the ground and as it breaks down, it improves the soil and it's also feeding your plants. Now, if you don't consider these all that pretty, I don't blame you. So if you're looking for something that's really attractive for inside the house, check these out. Now, these come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, and they're by such as rice straw and wheat straw, bamboo and reeds. And when you're through with these, these don't have to go to the recycle center. In fact, all you do is break these down and put them in your compost pile, and in a matter of months, you won't even know they're there. And I call that the ultimate in sustainability. Vegetable gardening is more and more popular, especially in the city. Kristen, we're here in your vegetable garden. You spend a lot of time out here. I certainly do, partly because there is a work involved in keeping a vegetable garden, but also because I find it so rewarding. You have uh, some vegetables, a variety of vegetables, in these raised mm -hmm. beds. Tell me a little bit about how you've set this whole garden up. Well, we like using a raised bed and coming in with the soil that we choose because we know it's clean, it doesn't have pests or diseases in it, we can choose a well-draining soil, and it allows us to come in with these micro-irrigation systems that directs the water directly to the base of the plant. We can control the watering. I've noticed also that there's a little bit of dieback, but you still have uh, fruits and flowers. Certainly, you can make the decision. What are you gonna do when you see a pest problem or see an insect? Do you come in with a natural uh, uh, pesticide? Do you choose not to treat it? I choose a lot of times to go ahead and let it go because I am still seeing good new growth. I'm seeing flowering. I know these plants are producing and they're fine. Remember, a vegetable garden is for production. It's not for looking pretty. You harvested a bunch of tomatoes. Tell me about this one. This one's the snowberry, which is a yellow cherry. It's high in sugars, mm. so, so good. And it's a, it's a great one for eating fresh and also for drying. The other tomato I love to grow is this one. This is Juliet, which is a cross between a grape and a Roma or Italian plum. First to flower, first to produce fruit. Let's check out your eggplant over here. You have a lot of eggplant, you and, must love it. Well, actually it's Stephen's favorite vegetable and it's my favorite too. This is the Ikebon, which is an Asian eggplant. It's great because you don't have to peel it. You don't have to soak it in salt water. But I have a real hard time giving this one away because my friends have no idea how to cook it. I'll take some. Okay, no problem, <laughs> I'll load you up. You know, when Patty grabbed those Asian style eggplant, I thought, eggplant dishes, my favorite, but they were apparently so delicious she ate them all herself, which is okay, Patty, no problem. I went ahead and grabbed these wonderful Italian-style eggplant from my farmer's market. And I know they're totally fresh, because when you run your thumb over them, there's no wrinkling. Now, it wouldn't be a roast eggplant caponata, and that's what we're making today, without roasting the eggplant first. Now, the oven is set at 400 degrees, and these will take about 12 to 15 minutes to roast. Just slice it right in half. And we'll also cut these down a little bit further so when it comes time 
To pull them out of the oven, all we have to do is cut them across and they'll be in much smaller pieces. Sheet pan, a little bit of aluminum foil or a touch of parchment paper, and then some olive oil, extra virgin olive oil so it doesn't stick. And we'll just place them right on top, just like that. Salt and pepper, a little more olive oil, and in the oven they go 12 to 15 minutes. And there we are. Okay, so caponata is nothing more than ratatouille, except we're adding some spice in here, some cumin, little red pepper flakes, and also some capers and green olives. And we're gonna prepare this by cooking things a little bit slowly, one at a time. We're gonna start with the onions, all right? So we just dice up this onion, little olive oil, and that's the first thing that goes in. Now, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. Starts the whole thing off. Oh yeah, it's probably three tablespoons. Delicious, so the onions go in there first. It's like butter, I love that sound. Now is the time to add the spice, all right? So the spices are gonna be these red pepper flakes. You're gonna add them now because they meld in with that olive oil, and then everything that I add to that afterwards has a little bit of warm and just a gentle heat to it. And this is cumin, freshly ground cumin, and it's smoky and a little bit sweet as well. There we go. Next stop, garlic. Do the same thing, we'll take them off. Give them a quick dice and in they go too. And we're a third of the way done. All right, the next thing, this really wonderful fennel. And fennel is really great because it has a sweeter flavor. If your kids like sweet, they're definitely gonna like fennel. It tastes a little bit like licorice. Now we'll give this a quick dice just like the onions and they follow suit. There we are. This is great, and then they cook down. What's the next thing we're gonna add? This great yellow pepper. Red pepper is great, orange pepper. Not so much the green pepper, because I don't think green pepper has a lot of flavor to it, to be honest with you. I'm gonna open it up, okay? And this top portion goes in your composter, and we'll do the same thing. And the reason why I'm cutting everything into cubes, for the most part, is because when they cook, I want them to cook uniformly. All right. And in they go. All right, now it's missing something. How about a little bit of color? These wonderful, fresh, garden fresh tomatoes. Now all I have to do is core them, dice them up, and in they go. All right. All these wonderful, fresh tomatoes, in they go as well. All right, now this looks great. Definitely want to check on this eggplant right now because I can smell it. it. Smells pretty darn good. So with these eggplant, all I want to do is quickly pull them off. They're definitely warm, and we're just going to chop them right across the side into smaller pieces. Definitely small enough to just put them in your mouth. The great thing about this recipe is it makes a wonderful appetizer. You can put them on little pieces of toast, crostini, and it actually gets better as time goes on. You make it once, and you can use it for many, many delicious meals. And in they go. All right, so with those in there, there's a couple more flavors we're going for, and I promised you capers and olives. Capers, you can chop them up, just a really rough chop, and they have wonderful, wonderful briny uh, flavor that goes perfectly with this dish. Okay, so the capers are in there. Grab a few of these wonderful green olives, and in they go. Now we're just about done. I mean, how cool is that? Few more things to do. One, which is to taste it, definitely. That's exactly what it needed. It's warm, but that balsamic vinegar brightened the whole thing up and it made it a little bit sweeter as well. Let's plate it up, guys. We wouldn't dive into that. And the great thing about eggplant, it's so delicious, really easy to grow. Bon appetit, guys. It's gratifying to know that a vegetable that's easy to grow can taste so delicious too and it's the perfect complement to a garden that provides nourishment to mind and body, and for this little plot of land, a safer and more sustainable environment that's also conserving precious resources. Whether you're a seasoned pro or someone just starting to make a difference in your own little corner of the world, creating an eco-friendly environment at home is becoming easier and more important than ever. By choosing the right plant for the right place, 
you'll automatically set in motion the wheels that will create a landscape that requires a lot less resources from all of us. And I think that's a great start. I'm Patty Moreno. And I'm Joe Lample. And for more information about anything you saw today and so much more, check us out on the web at growingagreenerworld.com. Race it to the tomatoes. I'm first! <laughs> this program was funded by the following. Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Live with Benz, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Live with Benz, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. At Subaru, we care about preserving the environment. That's why we build our vehicles in zero landfill plants, which produce less landfill waste in a year than a single family household in a day. Subaru, a proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. Were we supposed to still talk? Sorry. Yeah, was, Sorry. sorry. <laughs> now, you might guess from the color what these are made of. Corn, of course, and these are recyclable. Shoot, compostable. Pick up. All right, now the great thing about putting them in the oven like that is that... Uh, sorry, did I have you? Yeah. To order the Green Gardener's Guide for information on gardening and living green, for $16.95 plus shipping and handling, visit growingagreenerworld.com slash books. This program is presented by Blue Ridge PBS.